You're listening to Ask a Black Doctor, Friday Facts About COVID-19 featuring Dr. Bukasi Dubé. Join us every Friday at 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. for a half an hour as we discuss issues surrounding the current pandemic, vaccines and distribution, dispel myths, provide facts, and address concerns. We'll also be providing updates about COVID-19 vaccines and discuss how we can build a better culture around black health. Episodes will be available wherever you listen to podcasts, so head on over to the numbers.fm for the link to the show. Now let's jump into it. I'd like to thank you all for tuning in to Ask a Black Doctor with myself, DJ Ambush and Dr. Bakosi Dubé. We are in the beginning of a mini series on reproductive and sexual health. Um, and we're joined and will be joined by several guests throughout this series. I'm really, really excited to jump into this topic and um, get down to the brass tacks on some things that are very time sensitive. Uh, with me today, we have a myriad of guests, a bunch of guests today. Uh, I'm going to start off with someone who has been a guest in the past, and we're always really excited to have Dr. Heller with us. Good morning, Dr. Heller. Hello, how are you doing, DJ MV? Hello, everybody. <laughs> doing great, doing great. Dr. Heller, who else do we have with us today? So we also today have Dr. Uh, Hunt here with us to join our conversation. Dr. Hunt? Hi, everybody. Uh, Roberta Hunt, and I um, am a researcher and assistant professor at Portland State. I use she, her pronouns. I'm going to pass to um, Miss Marietta Gary-Smith. Thank you, Sister Dr. Professor Roberta Hunt. Uh, my name is Marietta Gary-Smith. My pronouns are she, her, and queen, which is reserved. Everybody uh, who is here with us today can use queen. It's, it's very specific. Um, and I am a uh, third generation Portlander. I have six generations of family members here and I am a, uh, I am an agitator, I'm a third generation agitator. And uh, my specialty, my area of expertise is in reproductive justice and sexuality. And I'm gonna pass it over to Ngozi. Thank you, Marietta. It's really good to be here. My name is Ngozi, I use she, they, and my name as pronouns and I um, grew up in Portland and um, have worked in sexual and reproductive health for uh, a while now, about about 20 years. Um, and yeah, really good to be here. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Um, so you know what? Let's just jump directly into it. Um, today is the 28th, the 29th, I'm sorry. Um, something major just recently happened. Um, Roe versus Wade was overturned uh can we can i can we go around the room and everyone give some of their initial reactions uh we i feel like we kind of saw this on the horizon with that um leak that happened about a month or two ago um it's even then it didn't feel like it felt like a real threat but it just didn't feel you know i didn't have the same reaction i did when it actually happened like no this really took place um if it's not too much, could you, could you all speak to how you felt in that moment? So this is uh, Dr. Heller, I'll start. So first of all, I would like to say, I feel that we saw the writing on the wall way back when um, Bush nominated Clarence Thomas. You know, and he, uh, Professor Anita Hill didn't tell no lies. And we right. should have we known back there. We also know for the last 30 years, this has been a plan of the GOP. They have steadily, you know, change the game, change the rules in regards to the Supreme Court and play the game in such a way where people stop paying attention and have been stacking the court steadily. People always focus on the Supreme Court, but the federal court, the federal court itself has been stacked. So the writing was on the wall. And as soon as Kavanaugh got through and then Amy Coney Bear, we knew, the, I felt, that I knew at that point the kick was up. It was just a matter of time before the case was made their way to the courts. So I wasn't upset when this happened on Friday because I knew it was coming. Um, if anything, I'm more frustrated by the people who do have power, Caucasian people, uh, deciding that they didn't need to do what they needed to do. And now they want us as black and brown folks to come in and save the day. So we didn't make the mess. Y'all cleared it up. I sparkle to what uh, Sister Dr. Heller just shared. I think it's important to, at least for me in my context, um, I'm from a family of agitators and I remember uh, hearing my grandmother and my mother and my aunts talk about what they had to endure as uh, femme identifying people as black women um, in this in this city in particular, uh, the, the family history in dealing with 
um, Planned Parenthood and other organizations like that. Um, so I wasn't surprised. I think what I was more surprised at is the amazement of other people who thought that this wasn't going to happen. Um, I think as uh, Sister Dr. Heller noted, the nominations of Kavanaugh and um, I'm going to say old girl because I can't remember her name. Uh, that's not to be disrespectful, but I think it fits, right? I think that was telling. And also because of the um, previous administration was very clear about stripping away a lot of the, um, the rights that folks had been advocating and fighting for for so long. So I wasn't, I was sadly disappointed as someone who's grown up understanding that this particular right was available to me and it's, and it's now not. Um, and again, even in that, even in that, um, as a black woman, as a black femme, I'm also really clear that even if it was law, it didn't mean it was accessible to me, right? That there were other things that were preventing uh, folks who look like me and other uh, people um, um, bodies with uteruses or other pregnant, uh, potentially pregnant folks were not going to have access for a lot of other reasons outside of a law that um, that said it was available or our legal right to seek it. So, uh, and I agree again with Sister Dr. Heller, the, the desire to see who's going to clean this up is fascinating. So I'm fascinated watching it. Like I'm interested, I'm intrigued by seeing these handmade tale memes come up, right? And people are just, you know, Oh, where's the, you know, I need to get my pussy hat. And it's like, no, it wasn't cute when you pulled it out, you know, three, four years ago. And it's certainly not cute today, but, you know, go off, like, if that's what you want to do. Um, so I wasn't surprised. Um, it's it's a little bit scary because my mind goes to the worst case scenario. So I'm like, oh, y'all are trying to go all the way back to, like, the first colonial days. Like, that's how my mind works. So, so it's a little scary. I'm trying not to be as cynical and depressing as I can be when I think about things like that. No, as far as cynicism is concerned, you're in a safe space. That's what yeah. I usually bring to the conversation. So anyone feel free. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone else it, want to chime in? You know, I mean, I, I, I think I, I very much um, share the uh, cynicism around this and um you know, it's it's an it's an attack on bodily autonomy, and um, that there are dominoes behind that, um, and that we we have a lot we have a lot of fights ahead of us. I think the the thing that to me is um, surprising and I know I should not be surprised is the way that protecting black women has been used um, on the on the right as justification for um, taking our rights away um, and uh, um, you know I think about the uh, movement uh, that said that abortion was black genocide and um, the uh, you know the Sister Song Collective, the Women of Women of Color um, uh, Reproductive Justice Organization out of Georgia, um, and really like some of the leading grassroots thinking um, around uh, sexual and reproductive justice, and they um, launched a Trust Black Women campaign against uh, this idea of. Um, uh, of using abortion and um, as an attack on black families, as an attack on um, uh, black women. And um, they, you know, with their trust black women campaign, I, it keeps, it is more relevant today, um, you know, than, than it was even when it was initially launched. Um, but, you know, uh, the right is is always willing to uh, use uh, black women and black um, uh, black bodies uh, to its white supremacist ends. I I'm gonna be honest. I don't even know how to follow all of that because again, surprise. It makes sense that. Uh, a lot of us, especially if you're not a black woman, it makes sense for the majority of us to be surprised, right? Because we are all experiencing different levels of privilege, male privilege, 
um, if you're outside of our community altogether, uh, whatever privilege your ethnicity gives you outside of being a black woman. That's a very unique perspective to speak from. Um, and to have seen the writing on the wall all this time and to carry on about your day, carry on about your life, exist in a uh, degree of sanity where it's just like a very slow car crash. You're just sitting here watching it. And then here I am asking you, how did you feel in that moment? And still see uh, all of you just like, yeah, mm -hmm, we saw it coming. And, and now, yes, the entire world is, is reacting to this. And ultimately it will be hoisted upon the shoulders of black women to try to solve this and fix this for everyone else while cosplaying is happening. It's, Oh, ooh. we got heavy early. Okay. All right. <laughs> we are in Oregon, though. And from what I've been hearing from our legislators, I believe Washington and California as well, they're trying to form a pact where we won't have to worry about that, where people that live within our borders won't have to worry about that. Can anyone speak to any information they have on that and how this impacts or does not impact Oregon? Well, here's a good thing. Um, so what we know is that ACOS, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Obstetrics and Gynecology, the region that we are in right now, for a number of years, we've already been looking at Oregon specifically, Washington specifically as um, havens, where if women in other states that have more restrictive laws like Texas, Alabama at all, um, women have already coming here. So we've already been having programs or plans set in place to make sure that we're a safe haven. So in the state of Oregon, I think it's really important to be clarified. So the Supreme Court did not take away legalized abortion. That's not what they did. What they did was they threw, threw the control back to the state so that states themselves can decide individually how they're gonna handle or manage the question of abortion. So the way that uh, the majority, unfortunately, majority, the majority of states have handled it is they've gone back to, to laws they had before, some which were very restrictive, where if you're, you know, the heartbeat laws, if there's a heartbeat, you can't do anything about it, or if you're past six weeks, blah, blah, blah. Um, that does not mean abortion is gone. That just means that people do not have safe access to abortions in those states, which of course means women are gonna die. That's different so much in, in places like Oregon, uh, California, Washington, other the 11 other states that have maintained um, safe access to abortion, where women have access um, and here, and unless the federal, unless the Supreme Court says that there's no legal abortion in any state, which by the way, Thomas is trying to do now, that in birth control, then unless that happens, we will maintain in our, it's enshrined in the constitution of the state of Oregon that we actually have protection um, and privacy in regards to our reproductive rights. That's not, I don't think it's enshrined in the constitution of California, but they have had laws where it's, it's safe there. So we still have safe access here. We are a, um, a safe haven, and there are already funds being um, created formally through ACOG, through the uh, Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, through MOCA Medicine, which is a 501c that program that I'm in, which is a bunch of Black female OBGYNs kind of practice that does OB and high-risk OB docs around town, and several other organizations so that that will help take care of transportation costs, um, housing here, and make sure that they're in, that they're able, that women who need help or birthing people who need help or who do not, who people, people who are pregnant against their will um, can get access that they need here in the state and that's protected by the state law. Yeah, and that um, in 2017, the Reproductive Health Equity Act was passed. So what Dr. Heller is referring to is that that basically with the passing of Reproductive Health Equity Act, that's um, a lot of times people refer to it as RIA. With the passing of that, it codified into law that abortion is legal in the state of Oregon. It codified into law the right to access and receive an abortion. It codified into law um, pr protections for healthcare providers, the right for a healthcare provider to provide an abortion. Um, it also, along with ensuring and, 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 and ensuring that in law that, that the right is there, it did, it did also expand coverage. Um, so it expanded services um, for, for people in Oregon 
around ensuring that people who are covered by certain insurance plans, um, those insurance plans have to pay for abortions. They have to reimburse for those um, abortions. They have to cover them. Um, and I say certain insurance plans because I can I can speak more on the, those details um, when we get to that. To that. Um, but it, certain people with um, commercial and certain in commercial insurance plans, um, they have to they have to cover abortions. Um, it also covers people who are covered by Oregon Health Plan OHP, and it also ensures that people who don't qualify for OHP due to their immigration status, whether they are, um, you know, waiting for their residency status, like they're in that five year waiting period, or they are DACA status, or they um, are undocumented. Um, people who are, don't qualify for OHP due to their immigration status will still be covered through Oregon Health Authority's reproductive health program. So they will reimburse providers for providing abortions um, for, for folks who are falling through the cracks due to their immigration status. Um, and there's without any regard to whether somebody lives in Oregon or not. So if somebody, there's no, like it's, it's, there's no restrictions for people, whether they live in Oregon or not. So anyone from any state, anywhere, they they can they can receive an abortion here, and it's and it's um, protected in this state. Um, there are some, of course, what's in the law and the expansion of services. There are there are still gaps and there are still barriers to access. So you know having these things in law doesn't necessarily ensure that everybody's getting equal access um, and, or that everybody is, is protected. So um, we can talk more about that, but that's, those are some of the details about the Reproductive Health Equity Act here in the state of Oregon. And to, to add to that, because it's one of the most progressive uh, legislation of its kind in the country, and really we need more of this um, in other states. It is also inclusive of trans and non-binary people. Um, so it's an incredibly comprehensive um, sexual and reproductive uh, legislation. And just to add to that, and that's where representation matters, right? Because we have people who are writing that bill who do not, don't, who identify not, cis, not cisgender, right? And so that was really helpful. And we also had people who were in the process of writing that bill who didn't look like the majority. So they really were thinking about everyone at that time. And to, and to follow up with what's been shared, I think it's also important to note that the origins of RIA, RIA as a bill started within communities of color. It was grounded and founded um, in spaces where black and brown and indigenous uh, femme identifying folks, women and other uh, trans non-binary folks were working uh, in a very specific um, way to build relationship. Um, what happens when you were in when you're in movement spaces that uh, what's really common is that um, mainstream or I can say the word here because I can say the word here, white organizations or white spaces uh, utilize wedges to keep communities of color, black and brown and indigenous folks separated, other communities of color, other culturally identifying folks, right? So what this collective of people came together to do was to actually talk about the wedges that are utilized to keep communities separated. And what did it mean to be in a solidarity and accompliceship, right? And allyship. I don't use the word ally because I, for some reason that it, I don't like it. Accompliceship um, to me means that you are willing to sacrifice and give something up. And so the conversations that started generated the foundation for what Rhea turned out to be, right? So again, it started in black and brown and indigenous spaces, black and brown and indigenous folks and other, other folks of color across multiple identities who were coming together to talk about what is it that we need to make sure that we have the right to our own bodies and making our decisions insured uh, and within the state. That says that they wanna be progressive, right? Oregon is this place that wants to be progressive. This is actually a representation of what progressive movement looks like in an active space. Dr. Heller, you mentioned something a little bit earlier. Uh, the word privacy popped up for me. Um, I believe it was a month or so ago when we first started having this conversation. I saw something about 
um, the importance of data and how that plays a part in tracking um, women's movements, especially around the pregnancy. And it hadn't occurred to me um, that there are entities right now that are looking to track, trade, sell the data that is acquired through the apps that women use to track their periods. Um, protections for healthcare providers also pops up in my head too, because we're talking about the ability for people being able to travel to places where they can have an abortion safely. Um, what exactly, what, what, what exactly are we talking about here when we're talking about, okay, Oregon's a safe haven, but if you're coming from a state where they have these, for lack of a better phrase, bounty hunter laws in place now where any citizen can file a lawsuit or report on someone that they think was pregnant. Like, how, do, how does that work out? How does that work out exactly? Uh, if someone can come to Oregon and still get the procedure done safely, but then they return to their state, is this still a situation where they can face that? So what I've seen, what I've seen, what we've heard so far from those of us physicians who are working in the space and trying to help with this space, um, a lot of us are, uh, okay, let's just break it down. Me personally, when I've talked to some, some of my, um, some of the other sisters in the struggle who are trying to, you know, make sure that patients are safe when they come here from Texas, that's the perfect place, that's what they're doing it, is I'm trying to give people who don't know how to use our language like our colloquiums, I'm trying to teach them how to be able to tell other people, you know, keep to hold this close to your chest. So, you know, luckily, if you think specifically for Texas, there are a lot of people in Texas who have, who have family here in Oregon. So that gives them the nice, easy pathway. They could just be going to visit their friend or their cousin. And if they, if you, if you keep in the piece of people say, why'd you go to Oregon and blah, blah, blah. I just want to go see my, I just want to go see my cousin. Hard stop. You know, and so it's a lot of times I feel like it's the people within the community having to teach those who don't look like us how to give people the correct language that while they're counseling their patients afterwards, even if even if certain things like, you know, if you have if you have complications, here's what you do. You have to warn them if you have complications, you can't tell people at home what that happened, what happened and why you have complication. You just have to say, well, you know, I was with my cousin, blah, blah, blah. I just need to call and make sure something, you know, that I just have to call and make sure and check on my cousin, make sure my cousin's okay. Like really just having to give people that language. So far, because we've had this little pipeline, so far, there hasn't been any issue, and we're lucky that some of the attorney generals in some of these states are refusing to uh, persecute or try to uh, try to persecute or push the, push the cases. And that's what's been coming out of this is there are a lot of attorney generals, state generals, uh, state attorneys who are saying they're not going to try to, to prosecute these cases. But really, I think that the biggest issue is we have to really learn or teach people who don't know better how to teach their patients the correct way to discuss yet not discuss what they were doing in order to stay safe. Because at the end of the day, it's one of those things where the skills of black and brown women to keep things close to our chest is one that's gonna save us. Yeah, this for me, you know, really brought up the question of HIPAA, you know, like how do you, how, how do you get access to people's medical information when there's supposedly protection of our medical information? So, this really raises that question. And I don't know if anybody, anybody here today knows more about this, but you know, I'm, I'm here, you know, I've heard, I can't remember which lawyer, but a lawyer, a lawyer's opinion was that this is actually that those laws aren't legal, like that you can't track people down. Sorry, not that HIPAA's illegal, but that, that the laws, this bounty hunter, hunter law, basically this like law that you can track people down, trace, oh, you received this medical procedure in another state, that that's not legal. You know, people can go to Mexico to go get a medical procedure. People can go anywhere they want to get a medical, to do, do what they want to do with their own bodies um, for healthcare. And so this really lends the, like, lends the question of like, how is that, how is that legal? How is that legal with HIPAA? Well, because so with HIPAA, no, it's not legal. But they're not going through HIPAA laws in order to, to rat on people. They're basically, people are basically saying, well, you, you look different, therefore you were pregnant, and then you went out of town. It's just based on suspicion, not actually based on medical history. And that's part of the problem. And there were a couple of actual federal judges who tried to strike that part down, 
But ultimately, in Texas specifically, they upheld that portion of it, the bounty hunter portion. And now it's deliberately really making its way to the print, the SCOTUS, and we know how it's going to end up in SCOTUS. Um, but, but the other issue, um, the people who are in the hospital helping you are not always the people who are on your side. And so the concern a lot of us as physicians have is we're concerned about the nurses or techs or other people knocking us out. And I have a personal experience with that. My first couple of years being here in Oregon, taking care of a patient, having a scrub nurse decide that I was performing a termination on a patient. I wasn't, but she decided I was and walked out and refused to help me and then told everybody that that's what I was doing. So with that experience, I know this happens. I know that, there, that some person will get some judgmental bug up their behind and go and say something. Um, and so really it's it goes back to people learning how to document stuff in a way that's safe for other people. And then us, a community worker, physician, nurse, whatever, really talking about the language that we have to use for people to protect themselves. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Dr. Heller, because it reminds me of somebody very close to me who um, had an abortion in the 80s um, here in Portland at an abortion clinic. But the person that was assisting, like the assistant to the doctor was actually there to dissuade people right before the abortion and do it. And this person that, that I know that went through this right before the abortion had this person in their ear by their bed, telling them, judging them for their choice. And trying to convince them not to make that choice right, right in the last, last, you know, minutes or however long before the procedure. And so it makes me think about, you know, like what, what, what people can do, individuals can do if they are choosing to receive an abortion to just make sure that they're protecting themselves as well with how much information they share with these people and to be aware that there, there is a possibility that there are providers that are actually not you know, that there are people that are working in these clinics that, um, that may not be actual, they may be actually um, not in support of somebody's right to access abortion and not supportive of that. So what, what can we do for, to help individuals like feel protected and be prepared, you know, around that possibility to protect their own personal information. Like be careful about sharing more than the necessary information when you receive these services um, in case there are people that have other, other agendas. I couldn't even imagine being in that particular circumstance you just described it being in a very vulnerable moment in your life and having someone in your ear trying to dissuade you um, from something that's already a tough decision to make and, and wow. Um, I, I do recall um, <laughs> when someone used to get pregnant back in the day and, you know, they'd go down south to visit family. I, I, I do remember that phrase, too. And they come back at the end of the summer and, you know, come back to school. It's a completely different situation. I do. <laughs> I do recall that. Um, I think, uh, again, black women are in a unique position to um, to lead everyone else through this primarily because you've just had to survive. You just had to survive these unrealistic and, and just terrible circumstances again on a daily basis. Um, unfortunately, uh, historically it's been shown you will never be credited <laughs> for the work that you're doing. You'll never be properly credited for leading us through all of these different circumstances. But here we are again, what are some of the things that, other members of our community can do? What are some of the ways that we can get involved in helping um, helping us make it through this? So I don't want to take over, but <laughs> so I think, I think first of all, it's important for us to tell the truth. So I think that we have to, I, you know, in our community, specifically in some churches, they're very anti-abortion, anti-contraception. So they push people towards pregnancy resource centers. Well, pregnancy resource centers are not actually a resource for pregnancy. They are very anti-abortion. And there's a lot of uh, lies and propaganda that are, that are said at these clinics. I think the first thing that we need to do is if we have a sister who says they went to one of these clinics, we tell them, we tell them the truth about what these clinics are, that they are not helping us. I think also we have to dispel a lot of myths about contraception. You know, I feel like, I, you know, we were talking earlier about, um, you know, what we can do early on as we see our rights being taken away. 
Well, what I have been doing since I was a resident is really talking about really good, long acting reversible contraception and trying to break a lot of myths in our community. Some rightly so, some based on history, but so that we know what is safe and what is not safe and, tell, and let, so that knowing that IUDs are great and it, which is important who puts it in and birth control, are, are, birth control pills are great for people who get to take them and stay away from depot because they will make you gain, they will make you gain weight but like telling the good the bad and the ugly about everything because if you more information we get good bad or ugly the better decision we can make but the problem that i see is that a lot of times as black women we are not educated to the same degree about what all of our choices are contraception wise doing the, the rhythm method which does work for some people doing pull out method for some people we have to be really honest and really work towards, since most of us, we are, this is our community. So we know what our myths are. We know what our misconceptions are. We have to do a better job of talking to that. And I think it's really important that we make sure that we talk to the partner. A lot of black men in this community still have a lot of misconceptions, misunderstandings, just flat out lack of knowledge regarding contraception, what pregnancy is, the fact that every single time a woman gets pregnant, she has a 50-50 chance of getting out of the lie. It's really not that much better than it was 100 years ago, when you think about it, especially for those of us of color. And I think that the more that we have these discussions and we bring the entire family in the, into the situ, into to that discussion, the more that we can protect ourselves in the long run. I totally yeah, and agree. I just, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say one thing about go the ahead. crisis no, pregnancy ahead, centers, because I, I got a little data point that here in Oregon. <laughs> Come on with the data, we need it. Yeah, Come I have on. a little data, I have a little data. So here in Oregon, crisis pregnancy centers outnumber abortion clinics three to one. So there are 38 crisis pregnancy centers. And I don't know how much, how many abortion clinics, but there's abortion clinics only exist in eight counties in Oregon. There are no abortion providers um, east of Bend. And only one abortion provider in Bend, and then everything else is along the I-5 corridor. So most of the geographic region of Oregon doesn't really have access, geographic access, um, but they do have geographic access to crisis pregnancy centers, um, which like I said, at, on average, they outnumber abortion clinics three to one in this state. I think that's a helpful point, both at uh, Dr. Heller and Ngozi raised. And I think a part of a connection to that could be that, uh, not could be, but uh, I'm a community-based. I, did, I started uh, my local career in terms of my work. I'm a community-grounded, community-based sexuality educator, right? So part of my work was making sure that I was in my community, talking to my folks, my community members. I was in um, uh, spiritual centers and houses of faith. Uh, when they would let me in. Sometimes I was told I couldn't be in there. I was called a harlot, you know, and people were like, if your grandmama heard you, and I would be like, you must not have known her because she would have said something about what you just said. Like, you know, we had to go through that. But I think it's important to to note that we also need to be clear about how we're getting this information and who is sharing it with us, right? I, I pride myself on being able to provide accurate information, um, medically accurate, up to date, and also culturally honoring and reflective information about how we're going to have the conversations about sex, how we're going to have the conversations about negotiation and communication, how we're going to have the conversation about body autonomy and respect, how we're going to have the conversation about what you do when you don't like. All of these things are part of reproductive justice, right? Learning how to navigate and negotiate. Um, and having these conversations, making sure that people, I feel you, Dr. Heller, oh my goodness, um, how to have these conversations about what we're going to do in shared space with each other, right? Because it be having access to abortion care is part of, is one small piece of the whole of reproductive health services and reproductive rights. So it's important to talk about this because it's a necessary discussion. And at the same time, it's a discussion we need to have about how we're going to be in relationship with each other, right? What does that mean? If we need support, that means that someone may need to drive us, that someone needs to be present for the aftercare process, that someone needs to be present to sit with us in the rooms, wherever we're going, that someone needs to be able to walk with us and be protection, you know, be protection, because there are going to be fools out here who are going to try to put their hands on people. So it's like there are different ways that we can engage in conversation about what does it look like to show up and be present and to also be quiet in the moments of making these decisions and then moving forward in the process because there are multiple steps in this process. So even if you don't necessarily agree with the decision that a person makes, if they've asked you for support and you've committed to it, show up and be quiet and support the person through the process, right? Because it's not the decision that you've made, you're honoring the decision that the person has made about what's necessary for them. So I, I feel like those are also components of the conversation that are that are necessary. 
I think also um, in support of that, the um, the bulk of people who have abortions may have children already, um, and uh, and may go on to have children, and so they are making the decision that is best for them in that moment because they know what it is to live that life, um, and like I. I remember listening to, to a doctor say to a group that there is no, um, you don't need to justify why you need an abortion. If you need an abortion, you need an abortion. Um, and, you know, I think when we, uh, bodily autonomy, as much as in the U.S., we talk about, um, you know, our uh, individuality, uh, around sex and sexuality, we want to control people. And we want to, and when we control people, we want to control populations. Um, and so for every time that um, black people and people of color uh, say, this is how I want to live my life. That is, um, that is a democratic value. Right. And so I, um, you said controlling populations. Um, I am old enough to remember the conspiracy theories we dealt with pre-2000 where they talked about population control and they trying to control us and all that good stuff. I think back then um, it was flipped that they were trying to lower the population, not understanding a relationship with capitalism needs to increase the population and how this plays a factor. Um, I saw something, uh, I think it was late last week or earlier this week, um, a Utah Republican talking about women need to control their semen intake. And how does it feel, having done the work that you've done, uh, and then you have people in leadership that are completely divorced from science and reality that are leading their constituents down the road to just peril. I mean, how, how, how does that, how frustrating is that to know that you're actually out here trying to get the work done, save people's lives. And then people in leadership and actual leadership that citizens should be counting on to help them are saying things like this. White supremacist, capitalist, heteropatriarchy. That's what that is. Absolutely. Because the issue is not about black bodies. They could care less if we die. The issue is the browning of America. They want more white lives. It's, and that woman said it with Trump. She yep. said, thank you, President Trump, for, for saving white lives. She said the, the quiet part out loud. This, is, this has got nothing to do with us. It's extremely frustrating, more so frustrating because the people who are in power are put there in power because people who don't look like me was worried that, that people who look like me were getting on par with them. So they screwed themselves trying to screw us, which is typical for this country. And I would just like to say and put this out that I know every single lady can agree. I can orgasm all day long and I'm not getting pregnant. It's not my fault. It's the, it's the irresponsible ejaculation. That's why people get pregnant. So if they really want to control pregnancy, control the irresponsible ejaculation. Leave us alone. Now that part, let me just say, they can continue to say stuff like that. That's not who I'm working in service to or for. So like I am not remotely moved. Like, I think it's problematic that they're making statements like that, because that's, that's an ignorant thing to say, just period. It's just ignorant and stupid to me. And I don't know this person, and they might be really nice, but I'm not invested in it either, right? And there's nothing about what I'm trying to do that is going to be remotely impacted by ignorant people making ignorant statements like that. It just reminds me of who I'm working in service to and for. And so it's like, that's a, that's a good barometer for me to be like, oh, y'all still out here people in Y'all still out here, you know, y'all still out here being, you know, 25, 20s. Like, I can't change anything about what folks are doing in that way. What's dangerous is that they are continuing to promote ideas and, you know, seeding ideas that are harmful because these are going to be repeated. Like, you know, we're going to we're going to see this show up like old girl standing with uh, with Ivanka's daddy. Right. We're going to continue to see that. And that's sad because it continues to provide a space where our work is not done and our work, my work uh, is very specific and focused. And I don't apologize for that. Like they, you know, I just, I tell them, I say, when I hear it, you know, I appreciate you for reminding me what I'm doing. Good day. Like I'm, you know, you don't get more than that. I'm not going to do that. That is amazing. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, 
as we wrap, I, I want to first off, I want to thank you all. Um, I'm really looking forward to continuing this conversation. There was something mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, y- yes, back not. So one thing that um, we really want people to understand is that this is about the fight for sexual and reproductive justice. And that is, uh, reproductive justice is the right to have a child, the right not to have a child, the right to parent the children we have in a safe and sustainable community free of uh, violence and uh, bodily autonomy. Um, And many, um, many issues fall under this, um, but really grounding that this intersection of both um, anti-racism and anti-sexism um, is about sexual and reproductive justice. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Dr. Hunt. And also, I just want to you know say that here in Oregon, when we think about moving forward, re, you know, Reproductive Health Equity Act does cover a lot, a lot of us, but there are still gaps, and you know, people with certain types of insurance plans. Um, are not guaranteed for it to be covered. And then there are, are, you know, just because you have insurance doesn't mean that you have the geographical access. Um, and, and then all the other things, transportation and all the, all the things that come from there. So there's a, a whole list of things that we, that we need to still look at in Oregon to just continue to ensure that everybody has access here, um, as, as well as people you know, people that, that come here for healthcare services, but there's still a lot of work to be done in Oregon around expanding access. Did anyone else want to have any, anything else to chime in before we close? I think to just, uh, to, to sparkle to what was shared previously, I think it's also important to note and moving forward, sort of considering uh, as we continue the conversation, um, this past year, the Oregon legislature just approved uh, $15 million dollars to be spent specifically on CBOs, community-based organizations to expand access to abortion care across the state. Um, that money is uh, that money was is being. Um, I want, what is the word I want to use? Uh, the organization that's sort of holding the money and leading that process is Seeding Justice, which is the only social justice foundation in the state of Oregon. Uh, the executive director, my mother uh, retired as the executive director. Uh, I want to say in 2016, she might be she might be mad if she hears this and be like, that's not the retirement date. Sorry, mom. Um, but the current ED uh, is an indigenous woman, say Adam Edmo, right? So I think it's important to understand that there are opportunities for uh, black, brown and indigenous folks to continue to figure out how they can engage in the process. This is one way, right? So um, for we have uh, the Oregon legislature made this very critical decision Um, to reinforce that this is a right for residents in this state and to support others who may be coming to our state. So there's an opportunity here to figure out what that looks like. You know, if we know of a community-based organization that deserves, you know, to be looked at in terms of receiving funds, if we want to help support um, considering how the funds are dispersed, right, or if we want to volunteer at these organizations, or if we want to engage in Um, being a support person to these different organizations across the state, right? I think there are different ways we can do it. There are Black folks in every county in the state. So it's not like we're not here. We've been here. You know, there are Brown folks in every county, Indigenous folks. This is is their home. This is their land, right? They're the original stewards. So I think it's important to be mindful of how we can continue to have a conversation pushing forward. Um, And this is just one way that we can do that. If if I can, I just want to say one more thing. Abortion care is health care. I think that when people think abortion, largely, largely when people think abortion, they're thinking this little bitty, this little bitty teeny tiny baby that's getting killed. That's often not the case. I mean, I think that sometimes people have to remember that at the very beginning, it's a clump of cells. That clump of cells can be lethal if it's not in the right spot. And that clump of cells can grow up and can, can cause other things to be lethal. We know that domestic violence and the death of, of pregnant people increases dramatically during a pregnancy, lethality. We know that postpartum depression in people who don't want to get pregnant can lead to psychosis and death, lethal. We know that in some women, especially when you consider the Black women three, three to five times likely to die than that compared to our white counterparts during pregnancy, that's lethal. So abortion care is health care at the end of the day. And that's that on that. Thank you all very much. Uh, this is only the beginning, uh, listeners. This is only the beginning of the mini series. This is actually a bonus episode that we felt 
very necessary to knock out um, before we actually jumped into the whole miniseries just because of the gravity of what just happened. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Please uh, like and share this with as many people in our community as possible. And if you have any questions for the doctors, you can always leave that in the comments anywhere you see this on social media, as well as the question form on the numbers website. Thank you so much, and we will catch you in the next show. Thanks for tuning in to Ask a Black Doctor, airing every Friday at 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. right here on The Numbers. If you missed it, you can find the link to the full episodes on our website at thenumbers.fm. You can also subscribe to the podcast on all streaming platforms. Be sure to rate and leave a comment. If you have questions you'd like answered on future episodes, you can submit them through our website or the link in our bio on Instagram and Twitter.